Welcome to our Monday Night Bible Study. My name is Inzaman Mirza, the lead pastor at Influence Church. And we've been studying from the book of 1 Corinthians. This is our third installment in our Bible study from the book of 1 Corinthians. Previous to this, we did an entire series called the Wisdom Series, where we studied the book of Proverbs. So if you missed any one of those um, episodes, what you can do is you can go onto our YouTube channel at Influence Church and you can click videos and you can rewatch any one of those segments so that you can catch up with what we've studied before. And of course, I'm sure you're going to see something that is going to reveal a truth about the Bible that you didn't even know before. So do that. And while you're doing that, why not hit the subscribe button? It's either on this side or it's on this side. I'm not too sure. But click the subscribe button so that you can be notified of all our latest content. And one last thing I want you to do for me, hit that share button so that your friends, family members, people you care about can be part of our Bible study tonight. So we are in the book of 1 Corinthians. And let's do a quick recap, right? Who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians? You can put it in the comments. Who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians? That's correct. Paul the Apostle wrote 1 Corinthians. How many books did Paul write? He wrote 13 books in the New Testament. And the book of Corinthians, who was it written to? It was written to the Corinthian church. And where was the Corinthian church located? All right, you got to correct again. The Corinthian church was located in Corinth. And like we said, Corinth was a wealthy nation and it was, well, wealthy state and it was located near to the seaport. So therefore there was a lot of trade, a lot of commerce and the church in Corinth was a Gentile church. Not many Jews lived in that area. So it was mostly Gentiles. And Paul had to write, giving them a lot of instructions, a lot of guidelines to help them in their walk with Jesus. Last week, we spoke about why are there so many denominations? Before that, we spoke on should women be pastors, you know, all these things we see in the book of 1 Corinthians, we see a lot of information that is very helpful to guide us in church, in our how our church is um, led by God. And of course, how we as believers, as Christians ought to operate, you know, what is acceptable. We also did a study on sexual immorality in the church. This book is packed with information and we're going to jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tonight. So why not turn with your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians and let's go to chapter 6. So we're going 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So are you there as yet? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All right, great. So let's get ready to start our study. And the title of our study for tonight is Should Christians Go to Court? Should Christians go to court? Should Christians take matters legally into court? Or is it biblically wrong for Christians to do this? Should a Christian go to court with another Christian believer to solve disputes that they would have? Or is this against what the Bible teaches, right? This is what we're going to study tonight. And we're going to see the answers right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, this is an important topic because there are extremes to where people have misused this passage of scripture to represent something that it does not mean. They have abused it to a certain extent and maybe to some extent they have even used it to give the church um, too much power in resolving matters. But let's look at it. Let's go through it and we're going to do a verse by verse study. So that means we're going to go through verse by verse, read the verse, we're going to break down each verse and then we're going to come to a conclusion and see what this verse says in context to the Corinthian church and how now it applies to us in this age and in this time. What is the Bible saying? Should Christians go to court? So let's begin reading in verse 1. It says, when you have a grievance against another, so... The word here is grievance. That doesn't mean that you're sad, right? That means that you have a dispute and you feel as though you have been treated unfairly and now you want the matter resolved. So if you have a dispute, if, you, um, if you've been treated unfairly, if someone did you wrong, they robbed you money, maybe they, um, you know, they stole something from you or maybe you just had an a, a argument and you can't come to an understanding. This is what they're speaking about, a grievance, right? But look at who the grievance, the grievance is against. The grievance is against another. 
And what, do, what does Paul mean by another? He means another person in the church, another member of the church. So in context, he's speaking to the Corinthian church about the church itself and one person in the church having a grievance against another person in the church, all right? So these are church members. So let's start off there. This is who he's speaking to. He's speaking to you and I, all right? Christians. He says, does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Now, when he says here, go to the law before the unrighteous, he's speaking about going to the court of law. Now, we, this is where knowing your audience becomes so important, right? Who he was writing to? He was writing to the Corinthian church and they were in Corinth and they were a Gentile nation. So if he was writing to the Jews, he wouldn't have, have made this statement because if you take the, a dispute in the synagogue and you carry it to the law in being the, the Pharisees or the rulers of that time, which were Jews, he would not have said unrighteous um, take the law to the uh, before the unrighteous because the law that they would have used in the courtrooms under the Jewish under Jews would have been the Torah right it would have been the Bible that would have been the what they governed and what they were ruled by of course we know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes um, they added a lot of extra laws into the Bible so that would have still been problematic because they would have used a lot of man-made rules that they would have added into the Torah to be the law, all right? So in both cases, it still applies, whether Jews or whether Gentiles, this statement still is applicable, all right? Applicable. Would you carry it before them instead of the saints? So by saints, who does he mean? He doesn't mean those who have died already, right? Sometimes when we refer to saints, we think about St. Peter, St. Paul. No, he's not referring to saints as in those who are dead or those who have no sin, right? What he means to by saints is he means believers in the church. You and I, we are considered saints. We are called saints because of the blood of Jesus that makes us righteous, all right? So he's talking about you and I. So would you carry it to the court of law instead of carrying it basically to a pastor, or to your leadership? This is the question. And in verse 2 he says, Do you not know that the saints, this is interesting, pay attention to this, right? He says the saints will judge the world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to trivial cases? Okay. <laughs> Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? This, this, okay, th what, what is he speaking about? Um, we know on the day of judgment, God is the one that judges, right? Either your book, your name is in the Lamb's book of life or it's not, right? So God is the judge. God is the one that is seated on heaven's throne. What is he speaking about? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? What he's speaking about here is actually in reference to the book of Revelation and to the end times. When Jesus returns in his second coming, he's coming to earth to establish a kingdom. And this is known as the millennial reign of Jesus, right? He's coming to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. When he establishes the kingdom of heaven on earth, the saints, those who um, were dead in Christ and, and were resurrected, and those who were alive in Christ and put on incorruptible bodies and met him in the air, the, those are the saints, right? Those that really made it as believers um, on the day of the Lord's return or until death. These are the ones who we will be seated, seated with Jesus, ruling and reigning over the earth for that thousand year period. This is what he's speaking about when he refers, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Similar to how you would have judges in the Old Testament, you would have kings in the Old Testament, you would have prophets in the Old Testament that were responsible for making judgment, making decisions when it came to managing the country, managing the people, managing resources, right? So this is why we are called to be leaders, right? God is looking for leaders. He's raising us up to be leaders. We ought not, we ought to be followers of Jesus, but we ought also to be able to lead, all right? So this is why at Influence Church, we say we're looking to raise up leaders and not followers, right? And then he says, and if, if the world is to be judged by you, which is accurate biblically, he's not speaking about any present time, although in the present time you are called to be leaders, but he's speaking about a future time. He's speaking about the return of Jesus Christ, the millennial reign. Are you incompetent to trivial cases? All right. So I like the word he uses. You know, Paul is really bland. Um, he is really brutal sometimes. Um, he just like comes out straight out, you know, hey, really? 
This is real small matters. This is real trivial stuff. You're really arguing about this. This is really an issue. Like, and can't you not sort it out? Because let's be honest, right? The issues that we tend to have in church between another brother or another sister in church, they are very trivial. And at times we explode these issues and we don't we, we say we can't see eye to eye. I can't talk to that person again. You know, I can't deal with them, you know. What are you going to do in heaven? Are you going to tell them you stay in your mansion and I'm going to stay in my mansion because I'm not talking to you? Hey, that can't exist in heaven. So, <laughs> this is really, are you incompetent to resolve trivial matters? This is really trivial. The reasons why we fight in, in amongst each other, it really is trivial. And I'm not undermining the pain. I'm not undermining the hurt that you feel. That is real. But it can be resolved, right? What did Jesus say? They ask, how many times are we to forgive? Is it seven times seven? And referring to the law, is it seven times? And he said, no, instead we forgive 70 times seven, right? So 70 times seven, that is 490 times, right? In other words, what Jesus was saying is forgive, on lim uh, forgive without a limit. Because if you are trying to forgive 490 times, you are going to forget how many or lose count of how many times you've forgiven someone along the way to 490, right? Unless you are extremely thorough and you have your black book and you're writing down every time, oh, they passed my street today, oh, they say this about me, oh, they didn't offer me something to eat, oh, they didn't give me, they didn't help me when I was in struggling, oh, they didn't pray for me. Unless you're so good to have a whole book writing down each time till you reach 490, the concept that Jesus was trying to get across was just forgive, forgive, forgive without a limit, right? Because you will lose track if you try to count to 490 times, right? If you are, then, I mean, if you could hold such a grudge to count 490 times somebody um, hurts you, then um, the question is really, are you really um, a follower of Jesus who've understood the way that God has forgiven us? Because definitely we have surpassed, I have surpassed hurting and sinning 490 times already in my lifetime. I'm sure that I, I don't count. I've, I've definitely have lose count if I was trying to. And God doesn't count either, right? He forgives and he forgets. Our sins are cast into the sea of forgetfulness, right? So trivial matters, trivial matters. We should be able to resolve this, right? And then he says, do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? But this for me is a really deep subject to get into, right? We are responsible for judging angels. Um, I'm not going to get into that tonight because I haven't done enough research and study to be able to really cross-examine this statement. Um, off the top of my head, I really can't recall passages in scriptures or references in scriptures that refers to us, you and I, Christians, believers, humans, judging angels, right? And um, then to the, wh why would angels need to be judged? Unless he's speaking about the fallen angels, which are the followers of Satan, which are what we know as demons, right? Maybe that's what he's referring to when he speaks about judging angels because Christ has given us all power and all authority over every principality, over every power, over every satanic force and over demons, right? In his name, we can cast out demons. Maybe that's what Paul is speaking about. I'm not 100% sure. So this is definitely a topic we could do some more study on where we can do our entire study on angels and demons and all these and, and this aspect of the, the supernatural, you know, the different types of angels, cherubim, seraphim, um, what are their different rules, <laughs> all these different things. We could look into that. We can do a full study on that, right? But for today, we'll, for today, we'll just put a pin on that statement, what Paul makes here, um, because then he goes on to say, how much more than pertaining to matters of this life? So... I mean, this is one verse and the question that he gives about judging angels is then followed by this statement, right? Which means that he's not speaking about in this lifetime because he says how much more matter, how much more than matters pertaining to this life. So he's referring to the afterlife in terms of um, eternal reign with Jesus. He's referring to the day of judgment as he is referring to, to after this lifetime, after we've lived in this human body for maybe 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, however long. Um, that is what he was referring to when he speaks about judging angels, right? So therefore, we could say he's not really speaking about demons or as he would have said in this life, because in this life, we have power and authority over demons. Maybe he's speaking about the, uh, is the fallen angels that are bound by fetters of chain. 
um, because of their because of them coming down to um, sleep with mankind. We see that in the in the book of Genesis, and still that is a that is something that um, is a very deep topic, and there's a lot of debate around that whether it was really angels or it really was um, if it was the children or the the righteous people at that time who was referred to as the sons of god so well, let's not get into all of that right that's a huge huge discussion right so let's say the whole of verse 3 is for a later study right the entire verse 3 take it pin it down write it in your notes so you can remind me at a later time we have to study the entire verse 3 in terms of angels right so then verse 4 it says so if you have such cases why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church, right? So he's saying, why go to a judge? Why go to, um, go to take things into legal matters? So like in our society, he's saying, why take a church dispute and then go into the courtrooms, right? The, and, and the courtrooms is no longer the church he's speaking about, but he's speaking about the legal structures in our country and try to resolve that matter there. Why take it there? when you should be able to resolve that matter between you and that brother, the Bible gives step. The first thing is that you talk to that brother one-on-one. -on -one. If he's not, if you're not able to resolve it among yourself, then you bring the elders of the church to help you in resolving that, right? So you should be able to do it. We should be able to resolve our conflicts, right? Um, like Solomon, when we were studying the wisdom series, he had to just solve a conflict where two women were saying that this child was their child. And then he said, well, cut the child in half. And then the real mother said, no, 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 don't do that. Give the child to the other mother. And he said, well, you are really the real mother because you didn't want to harm your child. So we should be able to solve these issues, right? So he's saying, why take them? Why take these issues um, that have and lay them before those who have no standing in the church? That also gives us a little insight into Paul's view of the government and those that are not Christians having any kind of um, say or position of authority in the church, right? He's saying that the court of law has no standing in the church. They, they are separate in terms of the, the authority and the power that the church has and the role that the church has to play in your life as a believer. Basically, what he's saying is that when it comes to the role that the church has to play in your life, the church has a higher um, weighting than the law, right? Than, than government. So <laughs> hear me out on this one. He's saying here that if the church makes a decision, even if what the church decides is not what the government decides, the church outranks the government when it comes to your life, right? Let me bring that into a real life example. If the government, um, let's say the government passes a law that um, that allows, um, let's go with bestiality, right? And it was like a very taboo thing and yeah, probably won't be allowed. But let's just go with that one as the example, not to step on any tools and stuff, right? So let's say the government allows this law bestiality where um, sex between a human and an animal is, pro is, is allowed. Now the church says, the Bible says, that that is strictly prohibited so which takes um which takes precedence in your life as a christian the church right not the law of the government even though the government says this is law this is legal the church says this is immoral and that is the, has the final um authority or say over your life that is what you should live by right this is what he's saying so the the government and their rules their laws does not have say over the church and what what they say because the church is the vessel of God, right? The church has the word of God and these, this is really not really a man saying what should be done, but this is God saying what should be done. So that's why it has that higher authority. Verse 5, I say this to you. I say this to you. I say this to your shame, sorry. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute without between the brothers? Um, so he, he's kind of dissing him here. I say this to your shame, right? Is it that in the entire church you have nobody wise enough that is able to settle this dispute, that is able to counsel, that is able to help out for there to be an ease of understanding between you and this brother, right? Um, notice this word here he says. He says nobody wise enough, right? Which really goes back to our wisdom series. 
we really need wisdom in our life and to be able to settle matters of the church. Right? Verse 6, But brother goes to the law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat to you. Right? So what he's saying as well is that this is also bringing public shame to the body of Christ, to the church. That two Christians would go to court because they have a dispute. We're supposed to love each other. We're supposed to live in harmony. We're supposed to be a family. We're supposed to be a safe community. We shouldn't really even have disputes. We shouldn't have um, grievances against each other. So just the fact that we have an issue, that, that two individuals would have an issue and have to go to the, before the courts of law to solve it, is already a shame to the body of Christ. Right? That's what he's saying in this verse. Um, Verse 7, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So what are you saying here? It comes back to the principle of Jesus, where Jesus said, if someone um, slaps you on your right side, then turn the other cheek and basically allow them to slap you on the on the left side right um, what he's saying is not to be bullied not to be a not that you should be a pushover or anything like that but he's speaking about a level of humility that if someone do, do wrong unto you then you know just forgive and move on he's saying why why not rather suffer wrong you know nothing is wrong nothing nothing is wrong with suffering wrong you know sometimes you think now we shouldn't be we shouldn't be wronged at all you know somebody should never do us something wrong somebody should never speak to us a certain way but if somebody does do you wrong you know why not just endure it jesus endured way more right this judas who was one of his disciples betrayed him jesus knew the entire time that judas would betray him but did jesus ever act upon it did jesus ever treat judas any way differently from the other um 11 disciples did he ever um humiliate him before or anything like that no he loved them just as much even though he knew he was gonna betray him right so why not suffer sometimes why not be defrauded sometimes uh, but here's the thing in verse 8. But he says, But you instead choose to do wrong to your own brothers and true to defraud your own brothers. And that should not be at all. You should not choose to deliberately hurt another Christian or treat them unfairly or rob them or, or steal from them or, or do anything that should lead to where there needs to be a resolution from the court of law. Verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you, do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So he gives a list of basically those who are in the positions of um, of judging you in society. Because he starts off about speaking going to the unrighteous. Um, to, to resolve a conflict and he's saying would you go to these people um, who will not inherit the kingdom of God to judge your life and you are supposed to be establishing the kingdom of God on earth so you are trying to establish a higher kingdom a higher um, standard of governance the governance of God on this earth but yet you are going to those who will not inherit the kingdom of God to decide how you should resolve your issues right um, and then verse 11, he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed. So he's saying, yes, yeah, some of you were like this. You were unrighteous, but Jesus saved you. You were sanctified by the blood of Jesus and you were justified. Now, this is a, this is um, some big theological words he's throwing out here. Sanctification, which is the process of um <laughs> the process of being more and more like Jesus. So from the time we get saved, the sanctification process begins and it goes on for the rest of our life, right? We are not, we are perfected when we are um when we meet Jesus in heaven. We are sanctified throughout life. Throughout life, day by day, we are being shaped and molded more and more to be like Jesus. However, while we are sanctified throughout life, we are justified. In the name of Jesus. So from the time we accept Jesus, we are justified. 
meaning that we have a place in heaven. So we are not becoming sanctified or we're not working out our salvation or working to be a better person or working to be more like Jesus so that we can be justified because we are not saved by works. We are justified. So we start being, we start off as justified and then now we work out our salvation daily. So it comes as though um, you have already paid for an item, you already purchased that item. However, you are working now to, um, to own the item. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a bad analogy, but it's already been paid for. It's already paid for. Now you are working to be the person that deserves that reward even though you didn't deserve it when it was given to you right when it was purchased for you you're now working in that sense to earn it but you have already earned it so it's a kind of conundrum it's a backward not backward but it's opposite to how hum humans think we think work to get something god is saying i'm giving you this and now you're working as a um as an act of love to me unto god not me but god that um you have been justified by the name of jesus christ so with all this information that's the last verse that we're going to be going through for tonight right with all this information what is the final conclusion should we as christians go to court or should we not go to court right because he speaks a lot about being able to resolve the issues between the brothers in the church right and um, by him saying that the issues should be resolved between the brothers in the church, it really speaks about the weight the church should have in the decisions that you make in this life. Because I think we've strayed a lot from that and we don't place the significance that the pastors and the leadership and the Bible has when it comes to deciding how we should live. Not just how we should live, but how we should resolve issues. And that was the main issue that was happening in the Corinthian church. They didn't, they, they didn't want to be subjected to the, um, the, the counseling and the decision that would be made by the elders, by the leaders in the church to how they should resolve an issue. So if the leaders were to say, okay, well, you owe this man $10, give him the $10. The man who owed $10 would say, who are you to tell me what I should do? You're just a leader in the church. Let me go to, let's take it to court instead and let the law deal with it. And that's the issue. We need to understand that even in matters that are not quote unquote churchy, you know, it's not to deal with who should lead worship or, you know, it's not in it. even in whatever matters that we have, once it's between us in the church, the family of God, we should allow the church to help us in those issues and subject to the decisions made by those that are elders of the church because they are making decisions that are led by the Holy Spirit and that are biblical. Now, if you are saying, well, um, the leadership in my church and the pastors in my church do make decisions that are biblical and are led by the Holy Spirit. Well, my best advice to you is that you need to be in a church that has a pastor and leadership that is led by God. Right? That is the whole purpose of being in a church, to be under um, the leadership of God through the pastor who is led by God. So first thing I want us to know is that we need to understand that the church has that significant role to play in our lives when we have disputes disputes between others that are part of the body of Christ, right? We should not leave it unresolved. We should not um, let hatred and bitterness start to grow in our life and just lock people off, quote unquote, and, and stop having anything to do with them. No. Talk to them first. Like Jesus said, as the first step, talk to them. If it doesn't resolve there, talk to the leadership of the church and let it be resolved within the church. Does that mean, however, that we cannot go to court at all? We should never to go to court if we have a dispute between a brother in the church. Because some people have used this extremity where they've said Christians should never go to court. If you have something, if somebody else does you wrong in the church, don't go to court. Even if, they, if it's $30,000 that they owe you for a job and they don't want to pay you, don't take them to court because it's another Christian. Don't do that. Is that what Paul is saying? No, not by any means. That's not what he's saying. He did say, however, the fact that you can't resolve it in church and have to go to court, it is a shame to the church and that is very unfortunate. However, if there is a matter that cannot be resolved by the church, there isn't anyone that could resolve this matter. The both parties aren't coming to agreement and they don't, they are defying 
or they don't want to be subjected to the decision that the church is making or they think that the church is making the wrong decision, then yes, you can go to court and let this matter be resolved in the courtroom. You can. While it is a shame to the church, it is not a sin, right? It's not um, a sin to actually go to court and resolve this issue between two members of the church. Now, can a Christian go to court with an unbeliever? Yes, that is not an issue as well. Um, of course, if that unbeliever is willing to take counsel from the pastor or from the church and make that um, come to a decision in that manner, even better. If not, however, nothing is wrong with going to court with somebody else concerning a dispute. Now, what about matters within the church, within um, church-related matters, right? So let's say matters considering people involved in ministry and maybe you have you think that that person shouldn't be involved in ministry because of x y and z um that person shouldn't be part of the church um leadership because of x y and z what do you do then just as this passage would have told us you take it to the elders of the church and you let there be a resolution there we saw even in our previous study when it came to sexual immorality in the church same thing the leadership of the church had to make a decision on what should be done they had to make a judgment call likewise if there is something like that you have um you do believe that someone should not be serving in ministry for whatever reason you have to take it to your pastor to the leadership of the church and let them make a judgment call if you feel as though they are not making a judgment call does that mean you take them to a court of law uh no no you don't take them to a court of law this issue has to be resolved within the church right and if it is maybe the pastors in leadership aren't making the the biblical decision now the decision can't be what you feel is right you know what you want it has to be the biblical sound decision that's based on scripture um, you must have biblical backing for decision that you think needs to be made then the pastor is supposed to be subject to someone over them as well a board of authority um a, a, a board that runs the church so then you may have to write a letter and take the matter in that sense to those above the pastors and let your um, matter be known right um, i know sometimes these things don't turn out well sometimes there aren't a resolution to these issues and it causes a lot of division in churches and that's why paul is saying this is a shame right it is a shame it is of loss to believers when we have disputes when we have fights when we disagree would we disagree on things yes of course we will would we have difference of opinions would we want to do things different from somebody else yeah we will why we come from different cultures different backgrounds the church is the most diverse group of people worshiping together so yes yeah, just like when you get married the person you get married to you start to realize um in the first couple of years well they like doing certain things a little different from me and then you have to come to agreement and compromise it's the same thing because you are now being indoctrinated and you're now being grafted into the body of christ and while you are learning kingdom principles um you still have a different way that you grew up doing something and you know to, that is the way that it should be done or you're accustomed to doing it so now you have to come to a place of compromise and agreement with other persons that are part of your family in the family of christ the body of christ however the, the allowing grievances to cause divisions where we don't resolve them that hurts the body of christ so much and yes it happens quite often in churches it even happened in the bible where paul and um paul and silas couldn't agree on um on mark john mark um silas wanted to take john mark on the journey paul didn't and because of that there was a split between them sorry i'm saying silas um it is Bar barnabas paul and barnabas right just double check that for me <laughs> paul and barnabas right and because of that they had a, a big split and they went opposite directions that split however caused a doubling right because there were two groups instead a doubling up or a greater amount of people being reached for the gospel because paul and barnabas went separate ways and the thing is that john mark was the same one that came back around and did work sorry i said paul i'm saying the wrong thing it's peter wow <laughs> peter um john mark came back around with peter and did work with peter and even the book of mark was written by john mark through the accounts that peter would have given him right so disputes do happen um sometimes they they are for the betterment of the church because the body of christ grows in this aspect and the work of god will always continue however it is disheartening at times when because of the disputes not being able to be resolved 
it causes division in the church it causes um a bad name or a bad reputation for the body of christ but in all things whatever the enemy has meant for evil god will turn it around for good and every division while it is um not good and i, I don't agree with divisions in the church at all we ought to be united um it's once the work of god continues to propel forward that is the important thing right so even though paul um peter and barnabas went separate ways the work of God continued on, all the missions continued, and a greater amount of people were saved. So sometimes these disputes aren't resolved, and they lead to a multiplication in the body of Christ. And that is all well and good. It should not lead, however, to a diminishing. It should not lead to people leaving the faith, people turning away from God. That is an extreme um, shame, you know, and it, it, it hurts not just the body of Christ, but it hurts the heart of Christ. Um, it hurts as me as a pastor. I, I'm disheartened when I hear about um, things happening in this manner and resulting in this outcome. Um, because for a soul to be lost, for someone to turn away from Jesus, is the most painful thing to the heart of God. Because he's losing a son or daughter. A son or daughter is losing their faith. I do believe that God works marvelous miracles and he will, he will do he will do miracles to get that person back into the fold of Christ. He will continue to go searching after that one like the good shepherd goes searching after the one and leaves the 99. He will pursue that one and they will return to Christ. However, these disputes are indeed very disheartening. So should, Christian go, should Christians go to court? They shouldn't. They shouldn't. However, it's not a sin if they do go to court. Let's try to resolve our conflicts between our brothers in the church in the church um and however if it leads to something more well unfortunately that would be the result going to court so the final answer for us that is yes christians can go to court but they should avoid it at all costs try to resolve it within the church it should be resolved within the church that brings us to the end of our study for tonight i hope that you were um you gain insight into the bible maybe you had a different concept Maybe you have questions, you can comment and send or you can WhatsApp your questions. Maybe you have, um, maybe you even have a disagreement with what I would have taught tonight. That's fine. You can send me that and we could um, come to a reasonable solution, of course. Um, so this brings us to the end of our study. I'll see you again in our next segment and we continue in the book of First Corinthians. Have a blessed evening.